it turned out to be architecturally very significant. Uh, um, I am Pave, famous architect, said that if it had been built near New York, it would be world famous. I was on the church planning committee back in the 1950s, 56, 61, as the youngest of uh, 12 monastic members. I think the abbot wrote to a dozen architects. Five responded that they were interested and came here and were interviewed, although one of them, Walter Gropius, came here to tell us, he said, that we ought to hire Breuer. Marcel Breuer had been one of his, first of all, students and then collaborators. So Breuer came here with the recommendation of Walter Gropius, but he sold himself, I think, on his own personality. We found him easy to talk to, uh, serious, thoughtful, he seemed to have a great sympathy for what we were thinking of as sort of basic monastic aesthetics. He said, simple materials, sympathetically used. The shape of the church in his original model, he did a model of the entire comprehensive plan. And there was the church, basically in the shape that it has now, trapezoidal, with this reflective shield because the church faced north there was a problem of getting light into the interior. And he thought of the banner being, as, first of all, a reflective shield. It was going to be picking up sunlight from the south and kind of reflecting it into a, an all-glass north wall. Of course, it's, it is a pre-Vatican II structure. The Vatican II started in the fall of 1962. This building was dedicated in the fall of 1961. So it is completed and in use before the Vatican II Council started. It embodies quite a lot of forward-looking liturgical thought, but that's because St. John's was very much a center of liturgical thinking from way back in the 1920s. Well, McGuff Construction of St. Paul got the contract to build the church and they hired a man named Ted Hoffmeyer as the superintendent of construction. The form work is incredibly complex. Boyer at one point in the planning uh, said that uh, he would want to have uh, someone on, on site as construction got underway because he said, you know, there's quite a lot of geometry in it. And that was an understatement. I was the mechanical engineer, even though I wasn't a, a license at the time. My total function was to make sure that everything in the building was to operate correctly, efficiently, and could be maintained. But I learned that when you meet someone great, they don't act with that way. The people who are that great are actually humble. Marcel Breuer spent as much time developing the design for the foundation as he did for literally creating the inner details of the building. And in talking to him, he said in his mechanical systems, what he wanted was something very quiet, to be comfortable, and most of all, not seen. Because the building was to take on the feeling of being timeless. We weren't to talk about money or the cost of mechanical because it was to be the best of this era and beyond. So, uh, and even back then, we did something very innovative though. In 1958, there was something about recovering heat the best way you can. We took care of certain areas by having the air recirculated and saving all that energy without having to add any additional equipment. So the building was really, uh, as we call it, green. It was energy efficient then. This is a building that is, from a mechanical standpoint, this was special. When I look at the building now, it really hasn't changed at all. It still has the same element of being so beautiful and beyond description because uh, people will come in and just Look at the wonders of how a man could conceive that. 
the, the window was almost an accident. I mean, there, there was going to be some kind of glass in that wall, but the notion of, of a stained glass window uh, emerged gradually in the planning process. We made the window here at St. John's, ordered glass from Europe, etc., and cut it up into pieces and put it back together and eventually installed it in the church. The window was designed by Mr. Bronislaus Bach. He was a artist on the faculty of the university. The name of the window is Sorsum Corda, which means lift up your hearts to God. The blue, it's prominent all over the whole window. It's simply the background that these colored columns rest on. The one round circle in the center of the window, it's white, it's pure, it's silent. It's a modern interpretation of an old medieval symbol, the eye of God. There are some straight lines radiating out into the various directions around it. These lines represent the grace of God working in us. And that's what the red section in the middle of the window means. It is the people of God. They return their thoughts to God in worship. The two green columns refer to the Old Testament. One is the tree of good fruit, which is mentioned as being in the Garden of Eden. The other one is the tree of Jesse, which is a reference to the lineage of Christ. There is a blue line and that's the reference to, it's by baptism, we become Christians. So the first column on the far left is a golden column, and it represents the season of Advent. In the next red and blue column, it's the incarnation. Christ is born, Christmas. We come to a purple panel. And we remember this period of time with the season of Lent. Lent ends with Easter. That's the next column. And it begins with the resurrection, but it ends with the ascension. And this column, Pentecost. So the theme, the, the title and the major theme meaning of the window is worship, worship of God. Can you tell me what year a triangle was created? How new is a pyramid design? Really, you look at that pyramid, could have been designed tomorrow because it has that element of design. This abbey has that design. I think that, that the effect of the structure is uh, rather timeless. That, I think, it, it, Breuer did achieve in a way that uh, doesn't always happen with buildings.